In this video, we're going to talk about counting. Yes, you already know how to count in the simplest sense, but counting becomes surprisingly complex surprisingly quickly. In fact, there is a whole field of mathematics devoted to counting. This field is called combinatorics, and it is one of the more difficult areas of mathematics. We're going to take just a few baby steps into the wide world of combinatorics, just far enough to get acquainted and for us to retrieve an important result that we will need when we study so-called binomial random variables in the next video. I like to introduce counting in the context of a sandwich shop. Suppose you come to the shop and you see that your options are limited. You can choose what kind of meat you want, beef, chicken, or tofu, and what kind of cheese, cheddar, jack, Swiss, or feta. You must have exactly one of each. If you don't want cheese, for example, they won't serve you. Now the question is, how many different types of sandwiches can be ordered? We can answer this by thinking about a counting tree. We know we have three options for meat. Suppose for the sake of argument that you pick beef. Then you still have four options for cheese. But the same would have been true if you had picked the tofu or the chicken. Every path through this tree leads to a specific sandwich. In particular, different endpoints always correspond to different sandwiches. The top cheddar, for example, corresponds to the beef and cheddar sandwich. The next cheddar down corresponds to the chicken and cheddar sandwich. The feta at the bottom corresponds to the tofu and feta sandwich. Since the different endpoints correspond to the different sandwiches, we can count the sandwiches by counting the tree's endpoints. How many endpoints are there? Well, there's three groups of four, so there are 12 endpoints, and thus 12 sandwiches. Or as we might lay this out more directly, we have three options for meat, each of which leads to four options for cheese, and so we can have 12 distinct sandwiches altogether. Let's alter the problem a little bit. Now the sandwich shop decides to let its customers choose the type of bread for the sandwich as well. You can have white, wheat, or rye. Now we'll ask the same question. How many different types of sandwiches can be ordered? Well, each path through the previous tree now sprouts three more branches from its endpoint. If you chose the chicken and cheddar, now you'd have to specify your choice of bread, too. This happens at every endpoint, of course, but I'm not going to put them all on our diagram because it would be far too messy. You should imagine them being there, though. Obviously, since every endpoint sprouts three new branches, the total number of sandwiches will triple. Or written out from scratch, we would have three options for meat, each of which leads to four options for cheese, each of which leads to three options for bread. Thus, we have 36 distinct sandwiches altogether. From these examples, we can abstract an important general principle, which normally goes by some ghastly title such as the fundamental principle of counting, but I just call it the sandwich rule. The sandwich rule states that the number of ways to make a sequence of choices is the product of the numbers of options at each stage. We've seen this in the context of sandwiches, but it works elsewhere. For example, Mr. Anonymous has four pairs of pants, five shirts, six hats, and eight jackets. If he always wears one of each, how many different outfits are available to him? And we'll assume that he does not care about them actually matching. To solve this, we just appeal to the sandwich rule, since this is quite obviously a sequence of choices. He has four options for his pants, each of which leads to five options for his shirt, then six for his hat, and eight for his jacket. Multiplying these numbers, we find that he has a total of 960 outfits. It's important to remember that behind every application of the sandwich rule lies a counting tree that justifies it, such as the one that I've partially sketched here. Every one of Mr. Anonymous's outfits corresponds to a path through the tree, and every path leads to a different outfit. This may seem too obvious to mention, but it won't always be the case, as we'll soon see. For our next example, we'll turn to Mrs. Anonymous who has four objects, an abacus, a balalaika, a crucible, and a doily. In how many different orders can she arrange these four rather heterogeneous objects in a row? To solve the problem, we'll call on the sandwich rule once again. The trick is to think of four empty positions into which these objects will be placed. We can then break this problem down into a sequence of choices. She has four options for what goes in the first slot, as I've indicated in our counting tree. For the sake of argument, Let's suppose she puts the abacus there. Now she has three options for what goes into the second slot, the balalaika, the crucible, or the doily. And note that even if she had chosen something different for the first slot, such as the doily, she'd still have three options. Again, for the sake of readability, I'm not going to draw all the branches on the tree, just enough to suggest to your mind's eye what the full tree looks like. Anyway, Mrs. Anonymous will have three options no matter what, so we can multiply her four options at the first stage by the three options she has at the second stage. For the sake of definiteness, 
Let's suppose she chooses the crucible second. Now she only has two options remaining for her next slot, and that would be the case no matter what choices she had made earlier. So we must multiply our total so far by two. Let's go ahead and imagine that she puts the doily in the third slot. Having done that, she has only one option for the final slot, the balalaika. And of course, no matter what she had chosen earlier, she'd always be left with just one option for the last slot. Hence, the sandwich rule tells us that the total number of ways to arrange these four objects in a row is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 24. Let's continue with a related problem. Mrs. Anonymous now has five objects, an abacus, a balalaika, a crucible, a doily, and a euphonium. In how many different orders can she arrange these five objects in a row? To solve this problem, we'll again imagine five slots into which the objects will be placed. There are five options for what goes in the first slot. For the sake of argument, let's suppose we put the doily there. There are four options for what goes in the next slot. Let's put the balalaika there. And of course, for the remaining slots, there are three, two, and one options respectively. Thus, by the sandwich rule, there are 120 orders altogether into which these five objects might be arranged. Well, suppose she now has six objects, the latest of which is a feather. In how many ways can she arrange them? I won't belabor the point. She has six options for the first position, five for the next, and so on, down to one option for the last slot. Multiply them out, and you find that she can arrange her half dozen objects in 720 different orders. Now let's do this abstractly. Suppose she has n objects. In how many ways can she arrange them in a row? Well, no matter what n is, she has n options for the first position in the row. For the second position, she has n minus 1 options, since she has already used up 1 by putting it in the first slot. For the next position, she has n minus 2 options. And this pattern continues, of course. By the time we reach the penultimate slot, she has only two objects left, so she has only two options for what to put there. And of course, there's only one option for the last slot, and we're done. Except there's a little more to say. This product of all the whole numbers from n down to 1 comes up so frequently in mathematics, especially in combinatorics, that we have a special name and a special symbol for it. We call it n factorial, and we write it like this. The exclamation mark is not indicating excitement, it's just indicating a factorial. Thus, for example, 3 factorial is shorthand for 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. And similarly, 5 factorial just means 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 120. Okay, now let's look back at our problem. Mrs. Anonymous has n objects. In how many ways can she arrange them in a row? As we've seen, she can do it in n factorial ways. This result is sufficiently important for us to put it in its own box. There are n factorial ways to arrange n objects in a row. For example, in how many ways can you order the letters in the word random? Well, random is made up of six distinct letters, and there are lots of ways of permuting them. Here are just a few of those permutations. But how many are there altogether? As we've seen, this is going to be six factorial ways. Your scientific calculator should have a factorial button on it. You may have to search for it under a menu. Once you've found it, you can just enter 6 factorial directly into your calculator, which will quickly tell you that 6 factorial is 720. So, there are 720 ways to order the letters in the word random. I want to make a quick observation about factorials, which we'll need soon. Consider a product like this. It's clearly related to 8 factorial, but it stops prematurely rather than going all the way down to 1. You probably remember that large swaths of algebra really amount to nothing more than clever ways of changing an expression's form while preserving its value. Well, that's what I'm going to do here. Let's multiply by all the missing factors in the factorial and then divide by them too. We haven't changed our expression's value, but we now see that our expression is equal to 8 factorial over 4 factorial. And we can do this with any product of consecutive numbers. For instance, take this product. It's not a factorial, but we can express it as a quotient of factorials if we multiply by all the missing factors in the factorial and then divide by them too, revealing that our product is 10 factorial over 5 factorial. Once you've seen this a couple of times, you don't need to write out the intermediate step. For example, consider this product of consecutive numbers. Pause the video for a moment to see if you can rewrite it as a quotient of factorials. Did you get it? Let's see. 
If you mentally multiplied by the missing factors and then divided them out, you should see that this is 43 factorial over 35 factorial. Let's try one more. See if you can rewrite this product of consecutive integers as a quotient of factorials. If you did it correctly, you should get 20 factorial over 17 factorial. So much for our observation. We will use it soon. For now, let's go back to the sandwich shop. Coming back, we see that something has changed. We can now select vegetables. This is a more interesting case because we select multiple vegetables. We'll start with a scenario in which there are four from which to choose. Lettuce, onion, tomato, and pickle. Yes, I know, a tomato is a fruit, but that's okay. We must choose two of them, and our question is, how many different pairs of vegetables can be ordered? At first glance, this seems easy enough. We have four options for the first vegetable, leaving only three for the second vegetable, since we're assuming that your veggies must be different, which means that there are 12 pairs of vegetables, right? Wrong. We can see why this is wrong if we look at our counting tree. Sure, there are 12 paths on our tree, but they don't all lead to different vegetable pairs. For example, this path will get you lettuce and tomato, while this one gets you tomato and lettuce. It's the same pair of vegetables. And there's nothing special about tomato and lettuce. Every pair of vegetables shows up twice on our counting tree. For example, here's onion and pickle, and here's pickle and onion. This means that when we made our original count of 12 paths, we counted every vegetable pair twice. Consequently, we should think about the problem this way. We have four options for the first vegetable, and three for the second vegetable, but we must divide this by two to correct for the overcounting. Hence, there are actually six pairs of vegetables that we can order. Let's vary this problem a bit and suppose that there are ten vegetables from which to choose, and we'll still pick two of them. In how many ways can we pick our pair? Well, there's ten options for the first vegetable and nine for the next, but once again, we should watch out for overcounting. So think of a particular pair, such as jalapenos and onions. Our tree will indeed contain one path leading to jalapenos and onions, but also another leading to onions and jalapenos, which is the same pair of vegetables. Of course, this doubling will occur for all pairs, so we'll need to divide by two to correct for overcounting. Thus, there are actually 45 pairs altogether. Okay, now let's make it a bit more interesting by supposing that we can now choose three vegetables from eight and determining how many different trios of vegetables can be ordered. You might want to pause the video here and try to work this out on your own before I explain, which I'll do now. The beginning is easy. We have eight options for the first vegetable, then seven, then six. Have we overcounted? We have, but by how much? Well, let's think about any old trio of vegetables. Say, lettuce, pickle, and onions. How many paths through the tree lead to this particular trio? Two? Three? There are actually six of them. We could have lettuce, pickle, and onion, lettuce, onion, and pickle, pickle, lettuce, and onion, and so forth. Now that seems like a bit of a pain to figure out, but there's a simple pattern here. All those orders in which our three vegetables can appear correspond to all the possible orders of the letters L, P, and O. And in how many ways can we order those three letters? As you know by now, it's three factorial, which happens to be six. So to get back to our analysis, we'll need to divide by three factorial to correct for overcounting, since every trio of vegetables appears on our tree three factorial times. Thus, we end up with 56 trios of vegetables. Let's do another one to make sure you understand the logic here. Let's suppose next that we must pick five vegetables from a larger group of 12. How many different groups of five vegetables can be ordered? Well, you know how our analysis begins. 12 options for the first vegetable and so on. Is this product going to be an overcount? Yes, of course, since any vegetable quintet, such as lettuce, pickle, onions, tomato, and jalapenos, will appear many different times on the counting tree in many different orders. How many different orders? Well, in how many ways can we order the five letters L, P, O, T, and J? Five factorial, of course. So every group of five vegetables appears five factorial times in the tree, which is far too big to draw. Hence, we need to divide by five factorial to correct for our massive overcount. This leaves us with a total of 792 groups of five vegetables. Now that we've done several problems like this, you should be able to see the common pattern. If we express this pattern algebraically, we'll be able to manipulate it into a famous form, which is one of the key building blocks of all combinatorics. To make the pattern clear, 
I'm going to set up a table in which we'll summarize some of the examples that we've already done. For instance, we considered the case in which we had 10 vegetable options of which we could choose two. We found that the number of pairs we could choose is 10 times 9 over 2. Yes, that's 45, but I want to maintain this form and manipulate it a bit so as to reveal the pattern that we're looking for. For our first manipulation, remember that in the last few examples, we ended up with a descending product of numbers divided by a factorial. In retrospect, this one seems a little peculiar for not having a factorial downstairs. Actually, 2 is 2 factorial, so we could go ahead and put one in there so that the same pattern will hold throughout all our examples. Let's manipulate this expression's form again, and again without changing its value. Upstairs, we have a product of consecutive whole numbers, and earlier we saw that any such product can be expressed as a quotient of factorials. Using the trick we discussed then, we can rewrite our expression as 10 factorial over 8 factorial all over 2 factorial. Now dividing by 2 factorial is the same as multiplying by 1 over 2 factorial, so this becomes 10 factorial over 2 factorial times 8 factorial. Finally, I'll add some color coding to our lump of factorials to relate its parts to the original question that it's answering. We also considered the case in which we had 8 vegetables from which to choose, and we had to pick 3 of them. We found earlier that the number of ways to do this was this. Let's rewrite that product of consecutive numbers on top as a quotient of factorials. Then, to clean up the mess of that fraction within a fraction, we'll do the division and simplify it to this form. And finally, we'll put in the color coding. Already a pattern seems to be emerging. Let's check one more case to see if it still holds. We've also seen that if we have 12 vegetables from which to choose a group of 5, we can choose our group in this many ways. Rewriting the top as a quotient of factorials, simplifying, and then putting in some color, we see that the pattern does still hold. It will always hold. Before we generalize this, let's clean up some of our mess. That's better. Just the essentials. But what is the count pointing at? Ah, there's our generalized question. Suppose we must choose r vegetables from a larger group of n. How many different groups are possible? Let's put this on our final row of the table. We have n options, of which we must choose r. How many different groups of r vegetables can we choose? We can go through the usual argument of multiplying consecutive numbers and then dividing by a factorial to correct for overcounting. But when the dust settles, the usual pattern holds. We'll get a fraction. What goes on top? Look at the previous cases. It should be the red number, factorial. So here it will be n factorial. What goes on the bottom? Again, the pattern is clear. We'll get two factors. One will be the purple number, factorial. So here we'll get r factorial. The other factor will be the factorial of the difference of the two numbers. So here it will be n minus r factorial. Now this expression is very common in mathematics. It's so common that we make up a new symbol for it, so that we don't have to write this mess out each and every time we need it, which is often. The shorthand symbol that we use for it is this. We read that symbol as n choose r which very conveniently reminds us of what it represents. Namely, n choose r, which is the name for this symbol, is shorthand for this algebraic expression, which represents the number of unordered groups of r objects that we can choose from n objects. For example, suppose we must pick four vegetables from 15 options. How many vegetable quartets are possible? Now that we have the combinatorial language of n choose r, we don't have to work this out from scratch anymore. We've got 15 vegetables to choose from. We want four of them. Obviously, we don't care about the order in which they come. So how many ways can we choose an unordered group of four from 15? Easy. That's just 15 choose four. What's the numerical value of that expression? According to the formula we discovered, it's 15 factorial over 4 factorial times 11 factorial. And if you work that out on your calculator, it comes out to 1,365 groups of four vegetables. Now here's something I think you'll like. Because n choose r is such a common expression in mathematics, the formula for it is programmed into every scientific calculator. You can usually find the button for it near the factorial button. Once you've found it, you can just punch in 15 choose 4 directly, and the calculator will immediately tell you that this is 
1365 without making you do all those computations with factorials. A word to the wise, though. Because most calculators write expressions on one line only, they do not like that vertical symbol for n choose r. Instead, your calculator's command for n choose r will probably look something like this. If so, the way to use it on your calculator is to put it between the 15 and the 4 and then press enter. All right, let's do another example. I'm going to pick three students from a class of 30 and give each of them a balalaika. In how many ways can I do this? Well, I'm choosing three from 30, and the order in which I pick the trio doesn't matter, since everyone who is picked gets the same thing. So, there are 30 choose three different trios of students I could pick. Consulting Texas Instruments, I find that this is 4,060 trios. Now let's alter this problem a bit. I'll pick three students from a glass of 30, give one a balalaika, one a euphonium, and one a vibraphone. In how many ways can I do this? Careful! Some people will rush in and say, it must be 30 choose 3 again. Those people are wrong. Remember, n choose r represents the number of unordered groups. In this problem, however, order matters. If Bob gets the balalaika, Eric gets the euphonium, and Vivian gets the vibraphone, that's a very different story than Bob getting the euphonium, Eric getting the vibraphone, and Vivian getting the balalaika. In the previous problem, it didn't matter because they were all getting balalaikas. Since order matters here, we can't use n choose r, at least not in the way that we've just tried to. So how can we solve this problem? I'll show you two different paths to the right answer. First, just go back to the sandwich rule. There are 30 options for who gets the balalaika, 29 for who gets the euphonium, and 28 for who gets the vibes. Put that all together, and you get 24,360 ways to distribute those three instruments, which is correct. Here's an alternate solution. We'll break this into a sequence of two choices. First, I'll pick an unordered trio of students, each of whom will get a musical instrument, though I haven't yet decided who gets what. There are 30 choose three ways for me to pick that unordered trio. Then I have to make my second choice. I must decide what order to put the trio in. In other words, I must decide who gets each instrument. In how many ways can I order my trio? In three factorial ways, of course. Multiplying these together, we get 24,360 once again. The moral of the story is that there are often multiple ways to solve a counting problem, but you must keep your wits about you and understand exactly what you are doing and what it represents. Just ramming numbers into formulas isn't going to be of much use. Let's do one last example, returning one last time to the sandwich shop. Suppose we come back and see that these are our options. One type of meat from three possibilities, one type of cheese from four possibilities, and four vegetables from ten possibilities. The question is, of course, how many different types of sandwiches can be ordered? Our solution will rely, of course, on the sandwich rule, since we're making a sequence of choices. We have three options for meat, four options for cheese, and now we must choose a group of vegetables. How many options do we have for our group of vegetables? Ten choose four. Work this out and you get 2,520 different sandwiches. So much for counting. In the next video, we will apply this to binomial random variables. Until then, I leave you with Frank Zappa, The Count, and a giant avocado.